Well, good morning. Good morning. I regret to inform you there are no announcements. I regret to inform you I'm not Dave Durande. But we have, been, we have been friends close to four decades now. So when he called and asked if I would come and spend time with you, it was my pleasure and my honor. So I'm so happy to be with you guys. Why don't we uh, bow our hearts and heads real quick before we get started. Father, in the matchless name of Messiah, we ask now, Lord, that you would be with us here, that as we study your word, you would increase our understanding, open up our, our minds as the Holy Spirit is the one who illuminates all of the text of scripture, Lord. And as we're going to speak about the spirit today, Lord, God, I pray that we would realize our absolute dependence is upon you, not upon the power of our intellect or the strength of our own hands, but it is wholly upon you, the God who is able to save and mighty to sustain. And we love you simply because you've loved us first. Amen. We pray this and more in the matchless name of Jesus and all of God's family said in one accord. Amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, and I'm sure hoping that you do, if not, I, I brought my NS, NASB. I could throw it out into the audience. So in, that's in case my iPad malfunctions. Only a fool fully trusts in electronics in this, this day and age. But if you have your Bible with you, if you would, turn in it to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 is our text today. We're going to be looking at the day the church was born. And I'm a little bit of a different kind of guy, so I will ask you in an old Presbyterian kind of way, if you would stand with me in reverence to God's word as we read scripture, I promise you can sit down again after we read it. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1 through 13 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then were, appeared to them were divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they were all filled or they were all amazed and they were perplexing one another. What could this mean? Others mocked and said they are full of new wine. You may be seated. This is what I like to call a pivotal position moment in the word of God. Now, didn't the Lord Jesus Christ tell his disciples that the Holy Spirit was coming? He did, didn't he? And isn't it ever so important that the Holy Spirit came and is still remaining with us? Now, I see two great mistakes in the body of Christ today. I should also preface very quickly. Um, I'm this weird mix of Sicilian and Middle Eastern bloods. So I get a little excited. I want everyone to know here in this congregation, I'm not yelling at you at any point. Okay. This is really, it's hard for me when I guest speak. Sometimes people at CCOB are used to my flailings and I had a good laugh at the sound guy. I said, I'll probably knock this thing off at least twice because the Italian part comes out and I talk on my hands a lot. I also smack headsets off my ear a lot. So I'm, I'm charismatic in nature, but I'm not charismatic in theology. So it's just, I'm, I'm a weird, rare breed. You either love me or hate me. Pastor Dave once said, I'm a lot like a barnacle. Once I grow on the side of you, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm stuck on you. You either 
you know. Look, you can live with the barnacle or you can get out a really sharp knife and scrape it off. It's your call. <laughs> but I, I see two massive excesses today in the church. And what I'm praying is for balance. I see some churches and their whole theme is if the Holy Spirit doesn't fall every time and everyone isn't, you know, speaking in other tongues and rolling on the floor like a freshly caught salmon thrown up on the riverbank, then it wasn't successful. I'm not mocking Pentecostal either. I, I want that to be well known. But I've seen some pretty bizarre things having grown up with a very Pentecostal mother. So I've seen some of these things, right? And it's, it's like no word of God and all Holy Spirit, right? And I tell people, no word of God and all Holy Spirit, and you will have a propensity to blow up. Yes. Ready? Now watch. Now I'll pick on like all the reformers and all the Presbyterians, all the, <laughs> right? It's like, you can't say the Holy Spirit. So I do it in Hebrew. How about Ruach Kokadesh? Do you like that better? That's <laughs> Numa Hagion. There it is in Greek. They, they are so afraid of the Pentecostal abuses that they get like all funky and crusty. And it's like, word of God, word of God, word of God, word of God. And holy smokes, the Holy Spirit's not even welcome here. <laughs> and so it's all word of God and no spirit. And you know what the problem happens in those churches? You dry up. You know, people walk in and they're like, yes, the preacher really exposited well today. And the joy of the Lord may or may not be their strength. <laughs> We're not sure. Sometimes referred to as the chosen frozen. I just offending everyone. I'm an equal opportunity offender in every way. And so we see this paradigm, all spirit and no word, and you blow up all word and no spirit and you dry up. But if you would couple the Holy ghost with Holy scripture, which he inspired in maturity in Christ, we will all grow up. We need the spirit, brothers and sisters, what are you going to do? You're going to live life. You're going to grow in your sanctification by the strength of your own hands. I'll quote my, bit, my I'll quote, I'll quote my British friend, poppycock. Yeah. No, it's a ridiculous notion. All right. The Holy spirit empowered, emboldened and filled his, his early apostolic church and nothing should have changed for the last 2000 years. We still need the spirit's grace and, and leading today. So this, this passage we're looking at here takes place on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost literally means 50, 50 days is literally what it means. All right. It's, it's a 50 day after Passover. So this is, if you didn't know, this is one of the three Jewish festivals that God had ordained for all able-bodied Jewish men to come. You needed to come to this. It's outlined for you in Leviticus 23. Love to go there, but we just don't have enough time. Pentecost comes again, as I said, 50 days after the feast of first fruits and first fruits, as you know, began the first Sunday after Pesach, after Passover. So it's a very cool thing to dive into. And if you don't study the old Testament, I have to let you know right now, you're pretty much ditching 77.3% of your Bible. Not smart. Okay. Unwise. It's, it's much like a meal. We need all of it to be sustained and to grow and to get that nutritional value. So Pentecost is very often called the feast of weeks because it fell seven weeks after first fruit. So you can see it's, it's got some logic in there. That's why it's called Pentecost. But I find that it is the one feast that is mind blowing when you study it because it's the one that God required. And that's the word required the children of Israel to include leaven in the grain offering. There's never leaven in the grain offering because sometimes and predominantly leaven is like sin or a type of Jesus warned people to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. But I tell people that's not the only thing leaven was representative of. It could also be representative of the ethnos, the nations sometimes could be like leaven. And it isn't it amazing that this is the first time that God wants the children of Israel to include leaven, include it. Usually it's excluded here. It's included. 
because I think Pentecost has a very prophetic attachment. It is known as Matan Torah, the giving of the law. And you see the real power of Pentecost is a person. Okay. It's not the apostles. It's not the faithful men of Israel and all the outlying areas who gathered there. The real absolute power of Pentecost is a person, the Holy spirit, the third member of the Godhead. The real power of Pentecost is the unhindered work of the spirit. I believe every Christian experiences this baptism upon their conversion, their faith in Christ. I'm not talking about the multiple subsequent fillings. I mean the baptism of the Holy spirit. This is where I think a lot of theologians have got it wrong. You've ever heard this terminology, the second blessing, anybody? It's bad theology. And I'll tell you why it's bad theology. A, I'll give you a thousand dollars for every time you find the word or phrase second blessing in the new Testament. I don't have a thousand dollars. So we can, we can debate and work out a bartering system. If you have a funky English translation that actually put it in there mistakenly. My big rub is scripturally. It doesn't make sense. And then watch logically. What really bothers me is if there is such a thing as the second blessing and not all Christians have received the baptism of the Holy spirit. Now we really have a problem. You know what we have? We have two classes of Christians. And as a theologian, that bothers me a lot because that's completely unscriptural. So now you're telling me you've got, you know, these poor unsanctified lowly Christians who, Oh, if they only had, what is it? It's all, it's, I always hear, I always hear Pentecost say the same thing. Well, you've only had more faith. Jesus said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move mountains. So more faith. It's not the power of faith. It's the object of our faith. Whom is almighty God. No. See in this twofold system, you would have these really super saints who received the baptism. And then you'd have all these lowly second class citizens of heaven who haven't. And it's a ridiculous notion. And I'll tell you why. First Corinthians 12, 13 is the nail in the coffin for no such thing as a second blessing. The apostle Paul tells us for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. It's so nice. I want to read it twice. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. If you think this is about water baptism, no way. It's a violation of context. Keep reading, keep going through Corinthians. It's not. In the Greek, baptized is in the aorist tense. And you think, so what? Who cares? Well, th this is what it means. It means it's a one and done. It means sign, seal, deliver. You're done, baby. The Holy Spirit has sealed his saints. Amen. Yeah. So let's go back and cut it up and divide it a little bit. Let's look at verses one through four. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. I love this passage so much. I've seen this Pentecostal paradigm where people have to fall on the ground and cry out. And you know, it, as, it's as if like the Holy ghost is like semi hard of hearing and the louder you shout, the more responsive he may be. I don't know. But I think one thing's amazing. And I bet most people look right over it. Because if you don't read with a critical eye, you will miss so many nuggets that God wants you to see. Does the text say that the apostles were gathered in one accord, jumping up and down, screaming and shouting, screaming, 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 Holy spirit fall. Is, is that what the text says? It says they were sitting, sitting. They were all sitting. And so the evidence of the spirit comes for us here. His coming was attested by three miraculous things, wind, something like fire, and then amazing praise, because that's what the tongues manifestation was. Remember when the men who had come there, 
faithfully to Pentecost, they heard everyone speaking in their own native dialect, their own language, the wonderful works of God. Sometimes people confuse that and say the wonderful words of God. It's works, the wonderful works of God. What is the most wonderful work of God? Anybody? You guys are well, well trained here, I can see. Our passage tells us that as the apostles were all gathered together, a sound came into the house as a mighty rushing wind. Jesus compared these born of the spirit to the wind in John 3, 8. And what's the amazing thing about wind? Can you see wind? No. Of course not. Can you see the effects of wind? Yes. Sure. Tree blowing over, leaves being blown off the tree. You can even see them caught in an upsweep. It's pretty amazing. You can see the effects of the wind, whereas seeing the wind itself is rather impossible. It's not a visible manifestation. It's a force, but it's, you can't see the wind. Well, the Holy Spirit is almighty God, but he doesn't have a visible manifestation. He can take visible manifestations, but he doesn't possess them. Neither does the father. And that's because only the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead incarnated where he forever wed his deity to humanity and what we call the hypostatic union in the person of Christ. So it's rare to see them. Although we do see visible manifestations of the father and the spirit, not that common, but I do think it's pretty awesome. If we go through again, I know not everyone, you know, likes that 39 books of that first part of the Bible we read, but I think it's a really important part of it. I meet a lot of Christians that are like, well, you know, you quote the old Testament a lot. I'm kind of a new Testament Christian. I'm like, really? Does it blow your mind that Jesus fulfilled 100 messianic prophecies about himself in the Tanakh, the first 77, you know, roughly percent of your Bible. You don't have logic without the old Testament. You don't have predictive prophecy. You don't have anyone to wait for. I tell a, a story that a lot of people think is made up and look, some preachers do that. You know, they'll tell you some pithy story about how someone was left on a train and you know, oh, and you Google it and you realize it's a joke. It's not even true. Here's one that's true. Lee Strobel, <clears throat> who again, Theologically, he and I probably wouldn't line up on every single page of scripture, but I think Lee Strobel is a pretty good guy and he loves the Lord. He was discipling and getting involved in a, a young Chinese man's life who had just moved here and he was learning English as a second language. And so Strobel kind of, you know, swooped in and saw the opportunity to really share and pour into this guy. And he said, uh, wh what can we do together? And the guy said, I'd love to study some of America's best literature. Oh baby, what's America's best literature? Your basic instruction before leaving earth, Bible. So Strobel gives him a Bible and says, you read a chapter or two a week. And when we get together, we'll discuss it. And we could talk about the English structure and you know, all kinds of different things. And Strobel's whole heart was just evangelism. He can't meet with the guy for two weeks. He has something come up pressing. They meet two weeks later. They sit down and he says, okay, so let's talk about how far you've gotten and let's talk about what you're studying. And he goes, uh, I'm in that last book, Malachi. <laughs> so Strobel's mind is a little <laughs> blown because this guy has read 99% of the Old Testament. So Strobel admits in his book, he's so perplexed, he doesn't actually know what to do. And he's a smart guy. He goes, uh, uh, do you uh, have, any, uh, yeah, have any questions? It's a good way to go when you don't know what to say. One of my favorite phrases when someone says something perplexing, perplexing to me is I always look at them in deep, serious, contemplative way. And I go, what do you mean by that? <laughs> See, I just hit the ball back on your side. What do you mean by that? So Strobel goes, well, do you have any questions? And the guy's answer is mind blowing. He says, yes. When is Israel's savior coming? It's a guy who has zero knowledge of the word of God was not regenerated by the Holy spirit, not a believer reading the old Testament as though it were good English literature. When is Israel's Messiah coming? You know, what's amazing. That man went on to become a fully Bible believing 
Christian. By reading the word of God. And I would say, I would say the God of the word opened his heart to understanding. But I think it's kind of cool that God does appear in the Old Testament in a whirlwind, doesn't he? He does so in the book of Job. All right. So it's not at all unlike God to show up at different times and in different various ways. We don't want to question those things because it's very interesting. The Hebrew word for wind is the exact same wind for breath, which is the exact same word for spirit. Ruah. I told you before, the Holy Spirit is Ruach Hokadesh. Ruach can literally mean any of those three things. And it's always context, 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 what it means. Spirit, wind, or breath. But you want to know what's even more mind boggling? A language that has nothing to do and is not even Semitic in nature is Koine Greek. All right. It's completely and absolutely as foreign and removed from Hebrew as you can get. All right. Koine Greek reads left to right, just the way English does. Hebrew reads backwards, which is why it throws so many people off trying to learn it. Ready for a moment of confession? I dropped Hebrew the second week in seminary. (laughs) Greek spoke to me so much more than Hebrew did. I know it's, I, I repent. I'm ashamed. I flogged myself once or twice over it. No, I just... It just blew my mind. I just could not understand it. But the Koine word pneuma also means breath, wind, or spirit. And I tell people that is something only God could ever do. The Hebrew word ruah is the equivalent to the Greek pneuma. They both mean breath, wind, or spirit. That's amazing. They have no dependence whatsoever. So it's interesting. How does God show up in a mighty rushing wind? Not at all uncommon. What about the other manifestation there? Tongues of fire. This is where people get really, really thrown off. What were the tongues of fire? Well, first we have to realize they weren't made of fire. Because if a tongue of fire sat on your head, you'd catch fire. That's, you know, I mean, let's just go with simple logic on this one. It it says clear as day in our text as, or like some translations say, I believe the divided tongues as a fire rested on each of the apostles heads. And I literally mean only the apostles. And I'll tell you why I believe that in a minute as a physical, visible manifestation of the Holy spirit. And I believe this because God makes many appearances in the form of fire or something like fire. There's a, there's an intimate tie in. Even the book of Hebrews says our God is an all consuming fire. So we don't have time to look at all of them, but I think we should look at some really important ones like Exodus three fourteen. It is the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses in the form of a burning bush. And what's amazing is that the bush is on fire yet it is not consumed, which is amazing because again, if God wanted to consume it, he did, but it was meant to be miraculous. It was meant to grab Moses' attention. And I love all of the very liberal and progressive scholars who just say the dumbest things ever. You know, it's like as if Moses is a full imbecile, right? 40 years is what he was in Midian tending Jethro, his father-in-law's sheep, right? Like the guy never saw fire. Like he's a caveman. We're supposed to believe. Oh, 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 fire. (laughs) Like why does everyone forget how smart Moses was? He was raised in Pharaoh's house. So for 40 years, trust me when he was old enough to speak and learn how to read and write, he had the greatest education in Egypt, 40 years being trained to be a real somebody. Then he sees two Hebrews having a fight and someone, you know, or should I say, he should see an Egyptian first beating a Hebrew and he kills him and buries him in the sand. Comes back a day later, finds two guys fighting. And he goes, what are you good? What are you doing here? You guys are brothers. Stop fighting. And one quite flippantly says, what are you going to do? Kill us and bury us in the sand like you did the Egyptian. And then what does Moses do? 
He beats feet. 40 years on the backside of the desert, being a real nobody. 40 years thinking he was a somebody. 40 years for God to break him down and realize he was a nobody so that God could take him for 40 years and make him the leader of Israel. But what is the most outstanding thing for me is realizing again, God's provision for the Israelites in that period of wilderness wandering. Not only does Yahweh appear in the form of a burning bush that is not consumed, but is ablaze is that he also appeared over the tabernacle in the wilderness, didn't he? And by day as a pillar of cloud and by night, a pillar of fire. You ever think of the significance of that? I mean, there's a lot of significance in that. Anyone here ever been in a desert? I've actually been to the desert, this actual one below Israel. Let me tell you something. It's really, really dry and really hot. And anyone who says, well, it's a dry heat, so it's different. <laughs> now, it's hot. Let me make a comparison to you. I have an oxyacetylene cutting torch at home. It's a very dry heat. If I ran it over your foot, you would say it was hot. So just because it's a dry heat doesn't mean anything. Hot is hot. But what does God do? He takes the visible manifestation of a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day that would have provided the Israelites with shade. I'll tell you something, on a hot day, shade is nice. He is their provision. What happens in the desert when the sun goes down? It gets like below 50. It gets cold. It can get really cold. It's not, not bizarre for it to go close to freezing in the desert. It happens all the time. And by night, God had manifested him how for the Israelites? As a pillar of fire, which sat above the tabernacle. Where did the Israelites encamp? Around the tabernacle. It's thought by many ancient rabbis and Hebrew scholars that that pillar of fire wouldn't have been a tiny little light but it would have been something ablaze that probably would have dissipated warm heat to all the surrounding area and not much further beyond the Israelites tents. What is our God? Our God is a personal God. He's intimate. He's involved. He knows the needs of his people. And what's amazing is he hears his people when they cry out. Do we realize that saints? We don't just have a God who hears our prayers. We have a God who answers our prayers. That's awesome. Because, you know, in a lot of other faith systems, the gods are capricious and nasty and backbiting and unfaithful and perverts. But it's all to keep you a deeper lesson. I can't stand that allegorical stuff. What? There's literally this one bizarre you know, story in Greek mythology where two young girls have taken their clothes off and laid them on a, on the bank and they're taking a bath and one God comes down and he steals their clothes and he sits in a tree and he laughs at them that they now have to walk back to their village naked. And I'll tell you the Greek interpretation. The God was trying to teach them to be responsible. The God was trying to teach them. You just can't flippantly throw your clothes up on the bank And Dr. Jason Falzerano says the God was a pervert who steals little girl's clothes and then is a peeping Tom in a treetop. And that's just bizarre. You have numerous accounts where warriors will pray to Ares and Ares, the God of war doesn't show up to help them. What a cheese ball. Like seriously, what a loser. Can you imagine that? I'm going to pray to my God. He kind of sucks. He could come. He might give victory. He could empower us. We don't know. That's awful. It's like we have the God who is everywhere present, all powerful and all knowing. The psalmist says before my lips can utter speech, you know what I will say. You know what's amazing about that? God wants us to say it anyway. I have children. They're teenagers now, which puts me at a whole different stage of life. (laughs) And every time they come to me and say, father, I know what they want. 
They want money. They want a ride to the mall. They want money and a ride to the mall. I, I know, I know what they need. I know what they desire. I know what they want. But I have to tell you as a father who loves his children with reckless abandon, I still want to hear them ask me so that I can meet that need. It's called relationship. And we're in that. Not only one unto another, but we are in covenant and we are in relationship with the God of all creation. Saints, is that not mind blowing? That's mind blowing. So we see that here on the day of Pentecost, that it is the Holy Spirit who gave these men utterance. When the, when the physical manifestation of something like tongues of fire rested upon all the apostles, then by supernatural ability, each one spoke in an unknown language. Now we need to clarify. It was an unknown language to the speaker. It was not an unknown language to the listener. And make no mistake, the word glossa in Greek means dialect or language. That's what it means. It means language. Not some crazy kind of, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. I do not believe for a second there is an angelic prayer language. I believe that's hyperbole. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Does not mean I want one of you to kill a horse, butcher it, and put it in the back of my SUV. That is not what that means. I'm using gross exaggerated language to prove a point. I'm hungry. Want to know why I'm hungry? And I'm hungry. I'll tell you right now. Cause I don't eat before I teach. Cause when I do, I stutter. So I always tell people, I come hungry to teach praying that God's people are hungry to learn. Amen. It's, it's a good pattern for me, but the apostle Paul uses gross over exaggerated language in the same passage. Though I give all that I have, though I give my body to be burned. If I have not love, it profits me nothing. That is gross, exaggerated language. What we need to understand is that something really miraculous happened at Pentecost. All right? Something miraculous happened at Pentecost. Let's turn back in our Bibles, verses 5 through 11 of Acts 2. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what could this mean? However, the mock saying they're full of new wine. Now remember, the feast of weeks or the feast of Pentecost was to be attended by all able-bodied Jewish men. And I can tell you right now that the temple court could easily fit well over 200,000 grown men. It wasn't hard. All right. The temple court's a big thing. I've been on the temple Mount, the retaining walls left over. were fairly positive where it was. It's not a mystery. It's a big open space. So if you read some liberal scholar who say, not every able-bodied man living in that time period could have ever fit. This is some kind of wrong, false. And I'm going to tell you, do you think just because it was required of God's law in Leviticus 23 for every able-bodied man of Jewish descent to come actually came? Do you think that? I guarantee you there were plenty of people who went, ah, Pentecost, ah, <laughs> you know, bring me, bring me something back. Get me a t-shirt or something, you know, <laughs> Pentecost. I, I was there. <laughs> Give me something. No, it doesn't mean that every single able-bodied Jewish man was there. They were required by faithfulness to be there. And that's a whole different sermon that'll preach about faithfulness that we don't have time for. 
So it's hard to put an exact number on it, but we can be sure that Jerusalem was packed with people. What about the people who were out in the city? They were still there for the feast. People cycled in and out of the temple all day long. Okay. And it's again, it's Jews from all around the world. On this day in particular, there were men gathered from all over the Middle East and the surrounding areas. And even if we count every single group, and I don't think you should, because Elamites and Parthians and Medes probably all spoke a common dialect, which is why they're the one group that's grouped together. But even let's be super, absolutely stringent in our count. If you count every single people group there, you would come up with a maximum number of 17. Maximum. And I tell people, I doubt it's that. I would guarantee it's between 11 and 12. If you counted if you counted with a little more understanding and realize that some of these people groups would have spoken common dialects. Notice this, all heard the apostle speaking the wonderful works of God in his own native language. Have you ever thought on this? The gift of tongues appears at least in my mind's eye to be an exact reversal of what happened at the tower of Babel. (laughs) Think about it all the way back in Genesis. God told the people disperse, right? Marry and pour out, fill the earth. This is again, after the flood, things had gotten drastically reduced again, right? And what does mankind in all of his idiocy say? Let us not be divided. Let's come together and build a tower that peers into the heavens. Babel means gateway of God. That's what it means. They were stargazers. They built a ziggurat, which is a pretty much like a pyramid with a little flattened top to it. But it was just meant for observing the stars. And that's what they were going to do. Forget about it. What does God know? God says, disperse, move out. No, no, no. We're going to stay together. We're going to be united in all things stupid. (laughs) And that's the failure of Babel. It's united for all things stupid. And every time we go against what God says, that's all we're doing. We're just exercising rebellion and disobedience. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is set in the human heart. Even the regenerate human heart sometimes set rebel, rebel, rebel. Oh, it is so much easier to yield and abide than to continue to rebel. At Babel, God confused everyone's language due to the rebellion. Here, God is allowing faithful men of Israel to hear about the wonder of his perfect will. I believe it was the gospel message over and over and over again. Jesus Christ the only mediator between God and man. First Corinthians 15 lays it out so clear. He died in accordance with the scriptures. He rose in accordance with the scriptures for our salvation. And everyone heard it. And some people said, what could this mean? But then what else do you have in every crowd? You got mockers and spurners, don't you? Ah, they're full of wine. Worse than that, new wine. That's wine that has even potentially a little more alcohol content because it hasn't mellowed yet. New wine, glucose, because it's got a high sugar content. It's got a high alcohol content too. Our text clearly states that at first, everyone was a little confused. They heard a noise. They're drawn in. And they continue to ask each other, what could this mean? I think it's awesome that there were many people who really wanted to know what was going on. These are the people that I call the let's get to the truth people. While the others are the natural born skeptics. Ah, these guys are all drunk on new wine. Matthew seven fourteen, Jesus, our Lord said, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. So it is another, it is a rather narrow way. And I think a lot of people misunderstand that. 
How many people have you actually heard say things like, I believe all roads lead to God. I dialogue with them and engage them. I say, you're absolutely right in judgment. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. That's not what I mean. You can't believe in Buddhism and biblical Christianity and, and, and Mormonism and the Jehovah's Witness group because they all have competing views of man's salvation. And everything which disagrees with one another becomes a massive blaring contradiction. Jesus could not have said any clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the father, but through me. That's why the way is narrow. And what's the problem? We got a bunch of people who actually are under the delusion that they're good. That's the world's biggest problem. What's the problem today? The world, we love ourselves. That's the problem with the world today. People are radically in love with themselves. Get up, spend 75 minutes fixing one hair. <laughs> My goodness. You're beautiful. Get out of the house already. I, I, I do college and career, our gradient group on Thursday nights. And I tell those young women all the time, you're beautiful. Stop obsessing about it. All right. Stop. Godly men are not looking for mere outward beauty because it's vain and it's fading. We're looking for beauty of the heart. That's what men, that's what godly men want. And ladies, you don't want to attract anything else than that. Trust me. All right. The gene pool is shallow in New Jersey. All right. Loser galore. Godly men in the bottom four percentile. I think I'm being really generous with my number. I'm just saying. That's what you want to attract a man who is going to love the Lord Jesus Christ more than you. Because if he doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ more than you, I want you to know he will be a lousy husband, a lousy father and a miserable provider. But when someone is wholly dedicated and follows what Christ said in Matthew 22, 30, uh, 37, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the most important commandment. Be holy and absolutely dedicated unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And everyone thinks that that's legalism. No, my brothers and sisters, that's freedom from bondage. That's not legalism. It's freedom. To quote Jesus in the book of John, right? He is the vine. We are the branches. And I'll tell you this much. Men make it so complicated. God makes it so easy. You are either abiding in Christ or you're not. There's no in between. You'll find zero gray area in that. When you abide in Christ, you are in the light as he is in the light. You're walking in the spirit. You're filled. You're not filled with the desires of the flesh because you're yielded to him. When you are not abiding, you are a wretch and you will do everything for yourself. We're either abiding or we're not abiding. It's it's one or the other. And when the gospel is presented, there are only two real possibilities, which is again, which makes it very narrow by definition. According to Matthew 7, 14, there are those who embrace it. And there are those who say, I don't need it, which is the same as the rejection of God's gracious offer of life eternal. Christianity is the only system of grace on the planet. Everything else is a system of works. And I've done it in seminars and I've done it in small group studies. You give me a world belief. You give me a philosophy. You give me a world religion. I'll tell you why it's a system of works. Islam, keeping all the pillars. You know, what's impossible about keeping the pillars. You need to make a Hajj, which means you need a holy journey. You can't even get to Saudi Arabia. People are on a waiting list. It's literally, it's five decades deep. You're never making it. So now you've got one pillar. This is the basis of religion. The Latin word relengari means to reconnect. You got to make a reconnection to God. You got to keep seeking God. And I tell people it's Jesus Christ who sought you. God is the one who came and sought man. In the garden, it's Adam, where are you? That's an intimate, personal God. That's a God who comes and seeks. 
It's not the other way around. I don't think that most, most people go on some kind of God quest. My friend's a seeker. What's he seeking? Lost treasure? Like, what is, is he like Indiana Jones? Does he wear a whip? Because that's, that's cool. No, God clearly comes and seeks us in many different ways. John 12, Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, John puts a little parenthesis there and says, he's talking about the cross. If I be lifted up from the earth, hung on a cross. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. That doesn't mean all men come. It means there's a drawing effect. You have to understand the difference between them. But I'd like you to turn in your Bible as we close out for today to John 16, starting with verse 7. John 16, 7. And the following says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Jesus told his disciples at a pivotal point that it was expedient or good or something they should desire that he goes away. Who would want Jesus to leave? Can you imagine that? Three years, completely devoted to him, following him, all the miracles, everything they saw, just amazing. And Jesus says, it's good that I go away. What? Well, Jesus said, if I don't go away, the parakletos, the Holy Spirit, the helper, the one who comes alongside, it's in the word parakletos, this para, parallel, who comes and who is here with us. Just as Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, you know who the Holy Spirit is? God who is inside of us. Amen. That's union with Christ, and we don't teach on it enough today in the church. But it's by way of our union with the Ruach Kokadesh, the Holy Spirit. Why was it so good for Jesus to leave so the Spirit could come? Because the Spirit could indwell the heart of every single person who called on the name of Yeshua. Amen. That's why. That's why. And so let's wrap up with a little bit of a summary and some significance. The Father sends the Holy Spirit to endow the church with spiritual, real spiritual power that we might be the physical body of Christ on this earth. Just as Jesus Christ was the visible physical manifestation of almighty God. Do you know what Christ wants his church to be visible, Amen. visible to this world, reaching out, preach brothers and sisters, preach. Every one of us is called to share the word of God. And you're not doing it by keen intellect or the power of your hands. You are endowed. You are full of God's spirit. If ye be in Christ, the gift of tongues was and is man speaking to God, praising him, extolling, worshiping, not God speaking to man. That Pentecostal paradigm is incorrect. Wrong. I've heard it dozens of times in Pentecostal churches. Someone has an alleged utterance of tongues and then someone has an interpretation and it always starts the same and it's always wrong. Oh, my little dear beloved children. Oh, my most holy ones whom I keep sanctified. That would be God speaking to men, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, you just messed up hard on that because tongues is man praising God. Right. Wrong way, guys. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Wrong way. The gift of tongues was the reversal of Babel. God dispersed because of unfaithfulness. Now we see faithfulness. We see people coming together and then what? God brings them together. 3,000 people come to a living, breathing salvation experience on the day of Pentecost. And I got to tell you something. Peter boldly stood up, filled with the Holy Ghost, and he gave a pretty short message. 
but he was filled with the spirit. You see, that's the difference between loudmouth Peter and sanctified, sealed, saved Peter, isn't it? You see Peter before the day of Pentecost and he's just like, he's got a foot in his mouth and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Then he <laughs> takes that out and he puts his other one in. And, oh, he said it. The only reason Peter, you know, didn't have a foot in his mouth is the interchange of taking the left out to put the right in. <laughs> and sometimes I feel that way. So I know all, all pastors immediately connect to the most spiritual apostles, right? John is who I find my internet. I'm definitely John. I'm very Johannian. Other people are like, Paul and Paul. I'm like, oh, I'm Peter. Hello. <laughs> Stupid, bold, arrogant, loud mouthed, quick decision making that I regret sometimes. <laughs> no one's going to want to, no one will be in Peter's line in heaven, but I'll be the first guy there. I'm like, I feel you, brah. Yeah, I know. Me too. Isn't it good that Jesus still loves us in spite of ourselves? So the day of Pentecost as seen in Acts 2 is a picture of God's amazing grace. He brought a divided people together for his glory and their salvation. And when we share about Christ, we'll probably only get one of two responses, won't we? Some people will say, what can this mean? Those are your learners. Continue to explain to them the beautiful picture of grace by faith. Others will mock and say, you're an idiot. And I would tell you this much, brothers and sisters, preach Christ crucified anyway, because it's not about us. It's always and shall always be about his glory. So we tell people, come just as you are, but that does not mean stay just as you are. As we come, something amazing happens. It's working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Know that it is God who both works both in us to do and to will. It's God who is working things out as we abide. It's so easy. It's so easy. As we yield to the spirit, the spirit brings about transformational grace in us. As we yield he changes our heart because the last time I checked, and I think we all agree, he is the potter and we are the clay. And I think every one of us need to be back on the spinning wheel of almighty God, Amen. that he would mold us and shape us into everything he wants us to be. Amen? Amen. So invite and understand salvation is of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. And while we do that, let's pray. Father God, we, we humble ourselves knowing that the spirit came to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment of sin, because people still do not believe in you, Lord of righteousness, because Christ ascended back to your hand and of judgment, because thankfully the ruler of this world is judged and we can boldly say with full assurance, greater is he that is within us than he that is within this world. We are signed, sealed and delivered in Christ. The Holy spirit is our guaranteed promise until the day of redemption. Thank you, father God, for how you love us. Thank you for how in the fullness of time you sent Christ born of a woman born under the curse to redeem those from the curse. Great is thy faithfulness and there's no one like you. And we love you simply because you have loved us first. And we pray this and more in the matchless name of Messiah Jesus and all of God's family said, amen. amen. Let's